Good evening, good evening. Uh, welcome to our broadcast for the evening. This is Pastor Galen Wright of the Third Avenue Missionary Baptist Church, and I would like to share with you, uh, would like for you to share in with us on our Bible study for this week. And it is with great joy that I receive all of you who are tuning in with us and joining in with us for our Bible study. Uh, let me begin by saying to all of you that uh, do join in with us who are not not members of this local church. I want to say thank you and how we appreciate you for tuning in week after week and joining in with us. We thank you for the uh, well wishes and the prayers that you offer up for us and for our broadcast, uh, which we do here on this broadcast. And we also have a radio broadcast. And we want to, we want to say thank you for just tuning in and watching and sharing with us. And we ask that you would continue to be in prayer that we are able to financially and physically and spiritually able that God will continue to make us able in these areas that we can continue to get the broadcast out to the world and get it out to share it with others. And, but we are grateful that he has allowed us to do this for many, many years. And we think it's because of, we believe that it is because of God's grace and because his favor over the Third Avenue Missionary Baptist Church. But I am the pastor, and I'm going to be sharing some Bible teachings with you today, and it is just to encourage you. It's, it's to keep you focused and keep you headed in the right direction of life. My prayer has always been for people to understand the grace of God or to accept the grace of God by understanding his word and allowing him to have free course in the lives of all of us so that we can live the honorable and peaceful life that God has asked us to do and provided for us. He has said to us that when, in as much that lies within you, live peaceably with all men. And I believe that you can have peace with men whenever you learn to have peace with yourself. And the, and the way we obtain this peace is we have to recognize and understand who we are and what we are. And then if there's corrections that need to be made, we can make them when we learn to acknowledge them. Well, we can make the corrections when we learn to acknowledge our mistakes and the faults that we have with us. So I just want to walk down through the scripture today and just kind of share some things with us about what nature we have within ourselves and how we are to respond to the, the natural nature of man and how we are to recognize it. And whenever error begins to take place or form in our lives, how we eradicate it, how we remove ourselves from it, and how we avoid it at all costs. So the scripture will teach us today and share something. Maybe you'll learn in the scripture today some things that will help you on your daily walk help you on your journey through this life, this life which we are often term as on this side of Calvary. We know that we have another side of, on, on the other side of Calvary, another life on the other side of Calvary. That's when we will be revealed and that's when we will be made into the likeness and into the image of God in his spiritual realm, in his spiritual person. So, but until then, God has blessed us with some great strength and power that comes through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that will enable us to live a life that is respectful, morally strong, uh, strong character, and uh, enjoyable and honorable life. God intends for us to have that if we would just trust him, if we would just believe in him, and if we would just stick close to his word, He'll lead us in those directions. So let us have a word of prayer, and then we'll move into our service for today. Our Lord and our God, we thank you again for this day, and thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Father, I pray now in the name of Jesus that you would grab hold of me and control my actions, control my speech, control uh, my every part of me that I might be used by you so that I can share your gospel and get it to all of your children. Father, bless those that have not had a, that do not have a church home. Bless them, Father, and show them the import, importance of having a place of worship. Father, I pray that you would lead them to a congregation that will accept them in and not uh, 
cast judgment upon them to the point to where they do not desire to come in fellowship with the brethren. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that we learn to be respectful when we do enter into the house of worship and learn how to put our guards down so that we don't have to try to fight any and everything, but learn to receive what you have for us. Father, I pray also for the peace in, in the homes where they're struggling and problems are. I pray, Father, for spiritual guidance to those that are fighting the not, the not uh, fighting demonic possessions and demonic spirits in their homes and in the, on their jobs and even just out in society as a whole. I pray, Father, that they would recognize it and realize that only you can handle demons. Only you can handle those types of distresses. So I pray, Father, for those that have that over their lives and, some, and those things that are uh, confounding them. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would bind them up and that you would control those spirits and, and get rid of those spirits out of the lives of your children whom you love. And Father, I pray that many will come and know that you're God. Teach me, O oh God, and teach us, O oh God, how to share your glorious gospel in a way that it compels men to Christ instead of cause them to run and rebel against your word. Teach us how to give with love and with compassion and a genuine and sincere heart. Father, I just again thank you for what you have done for us and for the, uh, us who have already received your great salvation. Pray, Father, that we don't try to keep it to ourselves, but learn how to share it with others and deal with those who are struggling with life at this time. Father, give us a calm and peaceful spirit, but also give us strength. Give us strength to stand against the wiles of this world. Give us strength, O oh God, that we can stand boldly and not be afraid nor be ashamed, knowing that you will bring victory into the uh, over the lives of of all of your children in whom you love and have compassion for. And Father, I just pray that you would get glory and honor through it all. And it's in your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to look into the scriptures. We're going to look into the book of Colossians today. Book of Colossians today. And we're going to look at a few scriptures uh, in chapter 3, a few, uh, beginning at cha in chapter 3, verse 1, and we're going to just kind of walk down through it, and I want you to impress upon you about the life of a Christian and how we ought to uh, live as a Christian, and I, I have to say it over and over again because some people take great offense to the term Christian, and uh, when we say that we are a child of God, uh, some take offense to that word Christian, and I understand why they take offense to that word, but I make no, um, it, uh, I, I don't apologize for using the term Christian. Christian, for my definition and my understanding, is to be Christ-like. And I know that I am not Christ, and I know who the Christ is, but I also know that he teaches us that we ought to follow in his ways and walk in his footsteps. And that's to my definition and understanding of this word Christian is to be Christ-like. And I want to be Christ-like. And I've accepted Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. So I know that, again, it's sometimes offensive to others because some have a problem with that word Christ. But I have no problems with Christ, the Messiah. I have no problems with it. I know that it's not his name, but it is his position and what he has done for us. He is Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. So therefore, I have a pretty good definition and an understanding. I have enough to know that I want him for myself and I desire for him to be my God. I desire for him to be my kinsman redeemer. So now I just want to talk about the life of the Christ-like individual, how the Christ-like individual ought to carry himself. And if you're trying to, if you're desiring to be like Christ, that means that you are rejecting living like the devil. And here in Colossians chapter three, we're gonna look at a few things that show us who we really are and how we're really made and what we need to do to make some changes in life. The life of 
that God intended for his children, for his man creation, was really a life of peace, a life of enjoyment, a life of good pleasure. But because of who we are by nature, the natural man, because of who we are, we do so much to destroy that atmosphere, so much to destroy that type of attitude, that type of behavior. We say we don't do it, but our actions speak louder than our words. And we, if we be truthful, we have brought in hatred, we've brought in rage, anger, malice, disrespect, dishonor. We have brought in division, and it has caused many a man to not have a, a joyful and peaceable life. God has intended for us to enjoy his good pleasure and all of his creation. He has given us dominion over all of it. And we spent most of our time not trying to have dominion over his creation, but we have separated ourselves. And now we try to have dominion over his creatures, which are us, his created beings. We would rather fight and dictate and take control of one another than to just have free course and have dominion over all of the land. We'd rather fight for a little piece of something when God has given us everything. And it has called, caused this destruction and it has caused us to walk with evil spirits. It has caused us to walk with fallen countenances. It has caused us to walk with a, stroke, with a life of struggle because we have adopted the practice of sin. And adopting the practice of sin, it has become worldwide. It's become worldwide, and now we're at the point now to where we really just expect uh, impossibilities. We expect disaster. We did expect turmoil. And God never intended for us to live this way. He never intended for us to have that. He never told us this is what we're supposed to do. In, term, in other words, and God has always told us how to avoid it. But when you avoid God, you, you end up avoiding his instructions. And without his instructions, we don't know how to maintain. And we get ourselves into some deep waters, and then we realize we can't swim. But in chapter 3 of this book of Colossians, we'll start off, it, it begins by saying, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. He starts off now and, and says that we have to have a change of desire. A change of desire. He said, seek those things which were above. Seek those things, oh, excuse me, if then you were raised with Christ. He's saying now, if you were raised with Christ, he's talking about, talking about now your acceptance of the work that the Christ has done for you. On Calvary, he was uh, beaten, bruised, and scorned. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, and then he was raised from the dead by God it's because God raised him from the dead on the third day. So now he says, now if you were raised with him, meaning if you have accepted it, if you have accepted this in your heart, the confession of your mouth and the belief in your heart, then thou shalt be saved. Now we are raised with him. Now we shall live forever with him. And he says, now if you were raised with me, seek those things which are above. Seek the things which are above. What is above? What he just told us, up above is where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the Father. And where Christ is, also his being is. And what is his being? His being is a life of joy, a life of pleasure, a life of happiness, a life of, of, of wisdom, a life of understanding. Seek those things which are above. What's, what's above? <laughs> above? The things above are things of God. They are the things that pleases God. It is the actions and the mindset and the reaction that uh, that he likes for us to have whenever we face difficulties, whenever we face problems and struggles, 
Seek those things which are above. What's above? Whatever we need is above because that's where God is. And whatever we need, we look to heaven. We look, as the old folks say, we look towards heaven's way. And we pray to God and we ask God to rain his blessings down over us. Give us his power. Give us his deliverance. Give us whatever we need at whatever particular point we are in life. If we are frustrated in a relationship, we ask for his guidance and his peace. <clears throat> if we're struggling with our finances, we call on him and ask him to rain down manna and financial rest, uh, uh, help for us. Whatever it is we desire, whatever it is we need, if we're struggling with making some uh, life-changing decisions, whether it is to leave family and go and live somewhere else or a change of pace in life or to try something that we're really not uh, uh, knowledgeable of, but we have a desire to try some things in life. Maybe you want to become a business owner. Maybe you want to change your job occupation. Maybe you're seeking to find out what it is you would be good at in life or prosperous in, in life or even productive in life. We look above for these things. We look and ask God to lead us through these things because these are great challenges. These are great challenges. Sometimes we're told what we should be or what we look like or what we ought to try. But in reality, sometimes you have it in your heart to become something, but you have no encouragement. God is there. All you have to do is talk to God about it and let him show you. Let him direct, direct you and stop allowing society to dictate who you are and what you have, what you will become. But he says, well, Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now look what he says, set your mind. And that's why I say you have to have a check. Sometimes it is necessary for us to have a change of mind, a change of mind from the mindset that has probably gotten us into a hole, gotten us into a deep, uh, a state of depression, a deep state of confusion. So it says now you got to change your mind. And I believe that if you ever learn to change your mind, it'll entail change your actions, it'll change your way of responding to certain situations. It'll change your way of of handling and and dealing with with obstacles and and even how to handle and manage pleasures. See, some people's struggles are not always uh, not having. Some people struggling struggle with having. Some people, whenever they have, it flips them. It, it, it changes them. It turns them into an individual that's uh, not what you would like to spend, who you would like to spend time with. Some people will get a little something and they, they get so greedy. They'll get covetous, or they'll get um, selfish, or, and they'll get proud and boisterous and boastful. And sometimes you say, and that's just because you got a little something, and they never realize that it can be here today and gone tomorrow. And they also sometimes never realize that just because you have it doesn't mean that uh, you know how to handle it. So God has to deal with this. We have to have God to teach us how to balance life, to balance ourselves in life. Maybe that's a better way to put it. For you, uh, it says, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Whenever a person determines who they are by the things that they have, I'll show you a person that doesn't have much. When you determine who you are by the things that you have, I'll, I'll show you a person that doesn't have much. I'd rather be a person with a strong spiritual identity than be a person with just a pocket full of money. I would rather be a person with strong morals and character. One who can, I, I'd rather be a, a wise person who knows how to carry themselves and how to move and how to deal with others and how to escalate and de-escalate situations. 
I'd rather be that person than to have <laughs> than have a garage and a parking lot full of automobiles. Because whenever I have clarity, and whenever I have understanding, whenever I have wisdom, I realize that nothing can ever have me, but I can always have that. And some people won't even grasp what I'm saying right now. You have to get to the point to where you realize the tangible things are easily obtained, but the pleasurable things, you have to deal with the Spirit of God. You've got to learn how to humble yourself. You have to learn how and the, ta and the spiritual things are what will carry you much further than the tangible. I would like to say the tangible entanglements, because usually that, that's really what happens when you get tied up with that. That's why it says set your affections on things above. See, you set your affection on what's, what's above. The wisdom of God is above. The understanding and the favor of God is above. Set your affection, set your desires to those things. And then he says to us, when Christ, uh, for you died in your life, excuse me, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Share, he's showing with you now what salvation really is all about. Salvation of the soul puts you into the body of Christ, puts you into the uh, it puts you into the love and care of God through His Son Christ, Jesus Christ. So once you're placed in there, you are entitled to all that your Father has because He promises it to you. And when Christ, who is our life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. He's coming from the heavenlies now. When he appears, you will appear with him in glory. He's saying whenever you leave this place, you have a destination not built by man's hands. You have a place within the kingdom, also within the family, the body of Christ. And remember what he said earlier, Set your affections on things above. You ought to always consider and remember that God has already promised you a life everlasting and eternal in the heavens with him. That should never leave your mind. You should forever rejoice in knowing that my life has now been made complete because in him will I move Will I breathe and will I have my being? And that's not just here. That's, as we say, over yonder. That's forever. That's throughout all of eternity. Now he says to us about our living. He, starts, he begins to teach us about our living. And your living comes from your intelligence or lack of intelligence, whichever state you may find yourself in. But your living comes from that, comes from your understanding or your misunderstanding. And the proof of your, uh, the, the determination of your understanding or misunderstanding is proved by your actions. So I can watch the way you live and that'll tell me how much you know or how much you don't know. So now he's getting to that here in verse number five. He says to us, therefore, Put to death your members, which are on the earth. Put to, get, put to death your members. Really, he's saying put to death your physical thought process. Put, put to death your physical action, your members, the thing, your, your, the, how you utilize your hands and how you uh, utilize your speech. Because we're going to get, it'll get off into that a little later. Put that off because it's being controlled by, it says by your member, it's talking about your body. He said, put off your natural way of life, your, 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 na your human nature, put it off because it's causing you to do things 
that are detrimental to your life. It's, you're causing it to also influence those who are around you. I've said it before and I'll say it again. You, you, you bring a fight and you'll get a fight. You bring trouble, you're going to get some trouble. You bring ignorance, you're going to breed ignorance. Whatever you bring, that's what you're going to get. As the scripture says, you reap what you sow, and you, and you reap according to how you sow. You, you sow much, you're going to reap much. You sow little, you reap little. And here in number five, it tells us that there are some members that we ought to put off. And look what he says, what we are to put off, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Look what he said, put off this fornication. That's a tough one for us in this society and this day. Now, we don't even believe now that fornication is a problem. We don't, we don't even recognize that as a problem. We now, in so many terms, we teach that you better try it before you ever establish a relationship of marriage because you don't ever know what you're, going, what you're taking home and how can you make a lifetime commitment to somebody and, and you don't know what that person is like. And I'm trying to keep it as clean as I possibly can. Well, if I look at the divorce rate now, I would I would imagine that a hundred percent of those that are in divorce or had a divorce, you were in fornication with that person before you married them anyway. So what's you talking about? You need to try it and 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 I didn't say well I won't say it I won't say it but you know what I'm talking about. Most of you did try it. And I, I'm sitting here on a limb saying that even 100% of you, you did. You, you probably did more because society tells you that it's all right. But here the scripture says you need to put that off. And your marriage will not stay together or be destroyed on that one factor. And if it does, you never really had a marriage in the first place. If, if that's the only thing, that causes you to stay together, you don't have much of a marriage. And if it's the only thing that causes you to just break up, you never was ready for marriage because it's more to marriage than just that act, just that piece of the puzzle. So now it says, but put it off. Why does God ask you to put it off? Why does he even go in that area to tell you to put that off? One reason he asked you to put it off is because in that very act, it is when a person is giving their self and giving their inner self over to somebody else. And it moves it from fornication really into idolatry. Because, and when you fornicate, it means that you have taken yourself and given it away or giving it to somebody that's really not worthy, really not worthy, but you've made a, that is a, that is a somewhat of a vow or a commitment when you give yourself. You really don't have much more to give after you do that because you have dedicated, you have given your soul, you have, you have done something precious and that's why God said, don't do it. Don't get caught up in it. But we don't look at it that way because society tells us that it's just a little pleasurable act. It's just a little pleasurable act, but no, it's, it's a lot more to it. And if it was just a pleasurable act, have you ever looked at what some of the consequences are? Some of the consequences are you can bring life into this world by that little insignificant act, that little, you know, just a little tater tater, that little fun you think you have. You could, you could possibly bring another life into this world. But if you look at it as just a little bitty act, if you ever bring a life into this world because of that little act, that's why it's so easy for you to get up and run away from your responsibility. And Holly, it's not mine. It's not my responsibility. And I don't want to take care of them. 
because you never looked at it the way God looks at it. And this is why he tells you, put that act off because it can bear some consequences that is that that will affect you for the rest of your life. But fornication being one of them, then he teaches us to put away uncleanness. This uncleanness describes spiritual impurities. He said, put it off. This spiritual impurity, you're impure. You have a form of godliness, but you really don't know God. You have, a, 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 I, I guess, a hollow or hollow hallelujah. There's not much in it. You really don't mean it. You're just saying it just to be saying it or you're doing something just to be doing. But put off this uncleanness. Put that off and put off this passion, this, this strong desire to do what's wrong. Put this passion off. It tells us also to put off evil desires. This evil desire. Society now is becoming more and more evil. We're decorating it to where we don't coin it as evil or, or look at it as being evil. But the, the repercussions of it is very evil. The outcome of it is extremely evil. We look at it. We, we, it's so much going on. I, I won't go into detail because I don't want to prolong it, the time for us. But we have so much, so many desires that we have and things that we, we, we have adopted now. If you just sit back and look at it and evaluate it, you'll find out that it really was kind of evil. It didn't look like it when you thought about it or when you said it, but if you look at the, you look at what it brought about, it's extremely evil. So now he tells us, put off this evil desire and covetousness. This covetousness has the idea of desire of wealth that others have. We desire success that others have. And we can debate it all day long, but the truth is some t some people don't feel as though they are they are, uh, are accomplishing goals unless they obtain what they see somebody else has. And then they'll set goals which are based on somebody else's standard of living. And now God is telling us, put off this covetousness because it's not just you desiring to be like the others. It also it gets to the point to where you'll do any and everything to get what others have. You'll cheat to get it. You'll rob them for it. You'll trick others so that you can have it. This is what covetousness is. I'll do anything. I'll get down in the dirt for it in order to have it. And I'll drop my morality. I'll drop my conduct. My, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll have loose conduct, loose behavior to obtain it. And we hear people say it in society. Now, I got to get that bag. I got to get it, uh, uh, get it how you live. I got to get it by any means necessary. You, you, God is not pleased with that. And you ought not to be pleased with that because people are looking at you and you're saying that I'll do anything for some stuff that other people have. I'll do whatever it takes to get like somebody else. You don't care enough about yourself to say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with who I am. I'm, I'm, I'm not even going, I'm not going to bow down. I'm not, going, I'm not going to degrade myself just to have something so I think somebody else can look at me differently. This is the behavior that God wants us to adopt. He wants us to put off some stuff in order to put on some stuff or to have some stuff. And he says now in verse number six, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the, <coughs> the sons of disobedience. Look what he says. Keep being covetous, keep being fornicators, keep being uh, having this evil desire, keep being keep keep practicing this idolatry, and you don't get what you're asking for. You're gonna get what you 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 keep asking for. 
You keep living that lifestyle. You, you cannot do the wrong thing and expect something right to happen. If you're unpleased, if you're not pleased with your life, maybe you ought to change your lifestyle. Maybe you ought to change your mind. Maybe you ought to change your concept of thinking. This is what God is saying. But if you do not change it, if you do not make the change, if you do not learn how to put this old man off, it's going to lead you down a road that you don't want to travel. And once you get so far down the road, there's no place for you to make a U-turn and it's going to get difficult for you. So now God is saying to the, here in Colossians that you ought to put it off. The believer has, a, has to have a union with Christ. He has to be joined with Christ. Now he says to us, but uh, uh, now, no, uh, now you yourselves are to put on, put off all these. Well, let me back up again and see. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And seven, he says, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. He's saying, look, don't put this stuff back on. And don't lead anybody else into that type of lifestyle. Because remember once you live that way. So you know how it is. You know the results of it. You know the you 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 know how it can tear you down and destroy you. Have you haven't you noticed uh the rich and the poor, the educated and the uneducated? Have you noticed all of them are say uh, are facing the same situations now? All of them must face all of them are facing depression, all are facing uh, uh, mental breakdown, having mental breakdowns. All of them are suffering pressures of life and none are really able to realize that God has everything under control. He has everything under control, and the, but the reason you're struggling is because you're trying to control everything. The rich is trying to control their finances and wealth and trying to keep it at all costs and it's driving them out of their mind and they're struggling with it and the less fortunate are struggling trying to obtain but none are really turning to God and say, God, I'm trying to control this stuff but it's ending up controlling me because now it's got my heart rate up. Now it's got my blood pressure up. Now it's got me full of worry. Now it has me full of stress and anxiety. Now I'm depressed because when I try to go and work to have this thing, now I no longer have my relationship. Now I no longer have friendship. Now I don't have time to myself. I don't have a peace of mind. Now I don't have the conflicts of life. And what is it? And God is saying, because you keep chasing. You keep chasing and not allowing me to show you how to enjoy life. I, I keep saying it, and I believe it. You really won't learn how to enjoy life until you just let life alone. Let life alone and watch how God works. Just learn how to appreciate what God does for you and learn how to utilize what God uh, gives to you. And you'll enjoy life much better, much better. Life isn't life it made for us to fight the way we're fighting. Life isn't made that way. And, and life is not for us to wake up every uh, day with some kind of controversy. Look what it does to us. Look, look, look at the mindset. Look at how people move now. We have to be careful. Everywhere we go, we have to be careful who we're around. We have to be careful about what we say. We have to be careful about uh, uh, the things that we do. Not try even if we not have any ill will or ill intent, we still might not be able to do it because somebody is going to be offended or it's going to hurt somebody. We had to learn how to calm down. We had to learn how to enjoy the pleasures of life. It's to the point now to where we can't even wake up and uh, go so anywhere and see somebody and say, "Well, hello, how are you doing?" Somebody look at you strange and, and, and wondering what your motives are. So we, we're, we're, we have to learn this Christian behavior. We got to learn how to handle it. We got to learn how to maintain. We got to learn how to stand boldly and say, I'm not going to let life break me this way. And I know God didn't intend for me to live this way. So therefore, I'm going to put it off. I'm going to put this 
wrath off. I'm going to put this idolatry off. I'm going to put this fornication off. I'm going to put all this off because it's causing my attitude to change. Look what happens. It's, it's, I'm, I'm telling you, it's causing your attitude to change. In verse 7 again, in which you yourself once walked when you lived in them. Now, verse 8, but now, now you uh, yourselves are to put off all these. Look what he said. This is what I want you to put off now. First, he talked about First, he talked about uncleanness, passion, evil desires. Uh, these were in the members. This was what was in the body. This is this is is really that what was off into us mentally. Now, now he's going to tell you to put off something that is physical. See that uncleanness, that passion, those evil desires, that covetousness. You had that in your heart. Now he's going to show you it manifests itself, and now it springs up through your physical actions. Look what he says to us. Put off all these anger. Now see, anger, now he's talking about this expression of anger, this fighting, this wanting to jump on people, this, this wanting to be aggressive all the time. Put off wrath. And this wrath, he says anger and wrath. Anger is just getting upset. Wrath is violent anger. You put off, put off this violent anger. I, I said to you before, now we've got the law that everybody should have the right to bear arms. Everybody should carry weapons. I don't have a problem with people having the right to bear arms. I don't, I don't have a problem with it. But I think and I see that it's not working out for our good to even entertain people having guns. Because now we see that even though you might have the right to bear arms and have your own, but not everybody knows how to use a gun or use this. Everybody's not going to use them for protection. You gave you you publicize everybody having right, and now you've got somebody who does not have the right intentions in their heart and in their mind, saying, "It's my right to have a gun," and they're shooting the innocent, and they're shooting at somebody and hitting the wrong person. But you keep, but we keep protesting. You gotta have the right there, and it's my, it's my right and my, my freedom, and I can do what I want to do. Yeah, it's a lot of things you, you, you can, you are, you're able to do, and it, you can go ahead and do it if you want to. That doesn't make it right, and that does not make it safe, and it's not wise. It's not wise at all. It says now, but you need to put off this anger and wrath. And like I said, a person might be citizen, might be his right to bear arms, but he probably has one of the mean, ill will attitudes of any person you've ever met. And you mean to tell me you want him to have a gun? You want to, <laughs> I know you want people to be able to protect themselves, but do you want that individual to possess it? So you see, you, you, you're you thinking right, or you thought it was a good idea, but wisdom says it's, it's really not a good idea. It's not a good idea because it falls into the hands of the wrong individual. person full of wrath and violence and anger. And usually when you get angry, you get upset and you get frustrated, you don't make good decisions. And before you do it, before you know it, you've done something that you can never take back committed an act that you can never get back. Wisdom will tell you, it will show you there's, there's a much better way. There's a much better way. But that's not the only example, but there's much more. But then it says also to put away malice. Malice is the behavior to do harm. That, that's when when you don't know how to exp express yourself You don't and keep your uh, keep your hands to yourself and you don't know how to keep your words with kindness and with grace. See, some people think that putting your hands on a person is violent. 
but words are extremely violent too. Words can cut, words can kill, words can destroy just as quick as a knife or a gun. And here when you have that malice in your heart, you can say some stuff and I say it now, be careful about how you speak because words are easily let out of your mouth, but they're hard to eat. Once they get out, you, you, you don't want to eat them. It's hard to get them back in. Once it's said, it's said. And you can say some things that could break a person's spirit. You can say some things that'll make a person hate you and never want to forgive you. You can say some things that will destroy a relationship that can never, that won't ever be mended. Malice is very dangerous. And these are physical now. It's past what you believe. It's manifesting now. So he tells you to put off the stuff, that, the evil that you have in your heart before you manifest it with your actions. So put off blasphemy, this disrespect of God. It, I maybe you should have put that first. Put off this blasphemy, this disrespect of God. This is not just acknowledging, uh, not acknowledging God. This, this disrespect is claiming God and living like the devil and doing what the devil leads you to do or convinces you to do. This is the blasphemy that you should put off. Not, not, not the, I don't believe in a God. It's the blasphemy is I believe God, but yet still I do what, what I want to do. I do what the devil does, tells me to do. I deal, I deal with what makes me feel good. But any, and also he says, put off this filthy language. This is not just curse words. Curse, curse words are not just filthy language, but they're also words that curse, with, with, which is filthy language. And what I mean by that, Cursing is saying some of the four letter what is it, the four letter words that we all not to say in public or not to say period really. But then are also words that curse. And that's filthy language. You all not to speak those words that demean and destroy and tear down and tear up. That's filthy language. That's the language of the devil. But the Bible says you ought to speak wisdom. You ought to speak with kindness. You ought to speak with understanding. You ought to speak. Let your words be seasoned. Let your words have some meaning, some power, some elevation to it. Your conversation ought to be such that whenever somebody leaves your presence, they ought to be better than they were before they came into your presence. You got to learn how to esteem others more highly than we esteem ourselves. We got to learn how to lift others up. We gotta have conversations that does not have envy and strife and jealousy in it. So now it says, put these things off, filthy language out of your mouth. And then it says in verse number nine, do not lie to one another. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. I'll close with that. We've got to put on this new man. What does the new man look like? The new man looks like the one that God has intended for us to become in life. The new man is one who where God says, uh, where David says, clean me up and renew a right spirit in me. Same man, I, I, and the, 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 uh, the man that it speaks of, I believe, over in Romans, I think, chapter 12. It tells us to uh, renew your mind, renew your spirit, put something new in me, make me over, clean me up. This is the new man that God intends for us to be because the old man, the old man should have had, should have had his day and had his time, but no longer is one who dictates and rule over your life. I'm concluding with that in this lesson today, and I hope that it has helped somebody and challenged you. Change your mind. Change your way of looking. 
if you are a child of God, learn how to walk as Christians, walk as Christ-like children of God. Learn how to govern your words, govern your actions. Learn how to change your heart, have a renewed heart and a renewed spirit. I pray that you take this and pray over it and come to an understanding with God that for the rest of my days, I'm going to learn how to be a better person. I'm going to make a change today. The old man is not worth it. The old life is not worth it. It's not giving me what my heart truly desires. And I pray that your heart desire is that you learn to live a life, learn to live the rest of your days here in the way that God wants you to live it. God bless you. And I, I pray that this has helped you. And now I want to invite you to listen to any and all of our services. You can join in with us on Sundays. We have a, our service begins at 1030. You can view it, social media, or you can come in and visit with us. We're at 2408 Elsie Faye Hagen's Drive. We are the 3rd Avenue Missionary Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. And then also you can partner with us in prayer, pray with us, and pray that God continues to share his word through this church and through this ministry work, and that saints will continue to be lifted up and that others who are not children of God will learn from here that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that salvation is free to all with the confession of the mouth and the belief in the heart that God has raised him from the dead. Until we meet again, God bless you.